Hello and welcome to Fidelity Connects. Glad you could join us today. Tonight, today we're going to be speaking about the Global Innovators Fund, and really we are going to be meeting Mark Schmail, who is the fund manager for this, also managing the Special Situations Fund as well as the Canadian Growth Company Fund. We'll be taking your questions in this difficult time in the markets. Mark is going to shed some light on some areas that you might want to take a look at to keep your spirits up. We go now to Kyle Sharapada. He's going to tell us how you can submit your questions and make sure that they get in the lineup here for Mark. Great. Thank you, Pamela. And thank you all for joining us. We have a very big group on the line today, and we want your questions to help shape our conversation. So if you have a question for Mark, simply click on the Q&A icon on the right side of your screen. That will open up a chat box where you can type in your question and submit. So I'll be back shortly with your audience questions. For now, we'll send it back over to Pamela. Great. So, Mark, let's begin. First of all, I'm glad you're here, here to answer these questions. It is a difficult time in the markets. You've been through some of these difficult times before. How do you traverse this? How do you go in and balance? So, difficult times in the market are hard. And I, I've always told people that half of investing is, is psychology and half of it is the numbers. And when markets get difficult, the psychology starts to take over. It's like an animal beast. And you look at your stocks and you look at your funds every day and you go, Oh, it's down again. Oh, it's down again. What's going on? I don't know. And, I, and people get scared. And when folks are scared, they make poor decisions. It's the opposite side of when folks you know, are ebullient and get greedy. They make bad decisions. Well, the other side is true as well. And the key I found, and I've been through three of these bad markets already, is to develop a process and a system and a way to deal with the stress. And what I was telling folks even six to nine months ago is, I felt very uncomfortable when the market was just rocketing up every day. Like, if anything, I felt the most uncomfortable I've ever been because, you know, you get accolades and people say you're a genius and, and you're sitting there and you're going, I'm really not a genius. I don't deserve all these accolades. The stuff I like is going up. That's great. But now, you know, the market's come down. My funds have come down about 20% from their peak in June. And I'm actually excited to come to work again because there are so many opportunities in the market. I know it's weird to say, and I know that most investors out there on the line are like, are you crazy? But you're in there hunting. You're I am in, in there, there hunting. looking and hunting. And I'm finally finding ideas. And so a lot of my funds, I tell people all the time, is the tails. So I own a lot of exciting stuff over here, and I own a lot of really awful stuff over here. And for the last three years, I've owned virtually no awful things because the market has just been one directional, right? It's been AI and, and transformative this and cloud and all these biotech stuff. And it's all exciting. Um, but the, the, the other stuff has been just non-existent. And now what I'm finding is I'm finding a lot more opportunity in the, the really broken, uh, left for dead sectors of the market. And it's exciting to go in there for again. For example? So a, a good, good example right now is, is home building. So if you look at home builders, um, they haven't been this chip cheap on a book value basis since the 2008 recession. In fact, they've never been this cheap. And if you if you look at a long term, like a 30 year chart of like a Lenar, it's one one of these home builders. You you pretty much never lost money buying it at this valuation. I mean, maybe you don't make money 12 months later, but you always made money. And it's interesting. It is not 2008 2009. Absolutely not. So if you go back to 2008 2009, I sold a house in Boston in that period, and I sold it to two doctors. They needed five different banks to guarantee their mortgage. It took like six months to close, and I brought my price down like 30% to get the deal done. That's not even close to today. If you, want a, if you want a mortgage, you can get a mortgage. What's happened is rates have come up a little bit, prices have come up a little bit, and folks are just saying, you know, I'm going to wait. It's kind of like when Toronto housing prices went up every single day, and then what would happen is the market, everyone would go, I'm not buying a house this year. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not buying a house. And then they'd wait 12 months, and the prices wouldn't go down, and they'd go, God, I have to buy a house. Should have gone in last year. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what you're seeing in the United States right now in, in housing, is housing is slowing. The stocks have been annihilated, because everyone remembers 2008, 2009. Oh, my God, the end of the world. And it's not. It's just not. It's not even remotely the same. I ran money through that period. This is not 2008, 2009. So you mentioned a, a number of trends. You're talking about cloud, AI. Mm -hmm. Tell us about some of the sustainable trends. You and I spoke off air a little while ago, and you said, you know, tech budgets aren't coming down. There are things that are going to continue to mm -hmm. have money flowing into them. Mm -hmm. What are some of those trends? So uh, another thing that people do when they get scared is they say, well, okay, this stock is up a lot, and it looks expensive, and I'm just going to sell it. And, and I think that what you need to do is you need to actually continue to do the work. So it doesn't matter that stocks are going down. You, you need to continue to look at these companies and go, 
all right, so maybe next year's not as fast. Maybe we don't grow at 4% next year. Maybe we grow at 2 maybe we're at 1%. I don't know what the number is. But what are companies spending money on? And, and will that change? And, and as we talked about, companies are going to continue to spend money on certain parts of technology, regardless of what the market does. These are mission-critical things that they need to do. They are still going to move to the cloud. They are still going to deploy software that works in the cloud. They might, they might spend less, less money on new PCs for their staff or you know, less money on the data center or stuff that they want to spend on. But certain parts of technology are actually secular growth. They will grow through everything that the market's going to throw at them. Even if we had a recession, these things are still going to grow. It's mission critical. It's transformative to a lot of business models. So again, what happens in, when fear takes over is people just throw out everything, right? And the key is to say, okay, yeah, maybe that one's busted, maybe this one's busted, but this, this stock right here is not busted, and so I'm going to buy more of that. And so what, what I'm doing in what has, can only be called a growth recession here is I am buying my favorite sort of cloud secular growth stories that I know three, four, five years from now will be doing really, really well in that type of environment. And the market's giving them to me like 40%, 50% cheaper than it was six months ago. So this is why I'm saying it's more exciting for me to invest right now. Because six months ago, it was like, well, business is great and hopefully it keeps being great. But there was no real edge necessarily. And now you can say, these seven companies are all going to go down. This one here is going to be gold. I want gold. And so you just keep buying more of the best ideas. Uh, sadly, the market sells everything. You know, just everything goes out the door. But these are, these are when you find opportunity. This is when you make money. Like right now is when you make the money for 12 months from now. When you make these decisions I make today is how I make money 12 months from now. E-commerce is an area that you see continuing to go mm -hmm. through expansion. I mean, we're coming up to sort of the Black Friday mm -hmm. weekends and so on. That's an area that we'll just continue to see stuff rolling mm -hmm. into that format. Mm -hmm. Yeah, e-commerce e is with us to stay. Companies need to continue to spend on lots of different types of technology to compete. If you're Walmart or Target, you have to spend on tech. You have to spend on certain types of tech. Um, Amazon's not going to dominate the world. And, and I think that people are starting to finally realize, you know, Amazon is a great company. They're already really big. And there's only so many things they can do well. Um, an example is food, right? They're doing food right now. Mm -hmm. Walmart's killing them in food. And food is very hard to do online. There's a lot of hurdles. There's a lot of issues. And Amazon is starting to admit that, you know what, this is harder than we thought. Mm -hmm. So Amazon can't do everything. Maybe they got Whole Foods at a good price, though. So maybe it's okay. I don't think they did. You don't think um, they did. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's interesting. So e-commerce is here to stay, and then there are winners in that, that space. And, and one of my favorite ideas is Etsy. Hmm. It's a dominant platform for arts and crafts. 83% of the traffic goes directly to Etsy. They don't get stuff from Google or Amazon. It's a great organic growth story, and they're on, like, day one of a 365-day turnaround. It's a, it's a fantastic story that, again, is being sold with the rest of the market. Okay, I think we're going to, Mark, start to take some questions from <coughs> viewers. Kyle, over to yes. you. Yes, we have a lot of questions coming in. Let's get right to them. So this is an advisor audience today, Mark, and we have somebody asking, what are some thoughts on how we can help protect investors' portfolios in this volatility? How do we protect investors' portfolios in this volatility? Yes. So, <clears throat> that's a complex answer. Mm -hmm. All right. There's probably a few pizzas that you have to put in to play. Yeah, so there are two ways to invest through these markets, and some of my colleagues will have different answers to this than I do. I have been through these cycles before. What I do and what I have always done is I invest for the recovery. So I have found that you know, if you try and play the absolute return game and you buy defensive stocks and you hope they don't go down too much, it doesn't work for me because in many cases these are bad companies that nobody wanted to own in the first place and they just don't go down as much. Or they're utilities, or it's cash, or it's gold, or some terrible asset class I never want to invest in. So for me, what I try and do is I try and buy the companies that you know I think 12 months from now are going to be great or two years from now are going to be great. Or they are the, the pockets of opportunity for when fundamentals change that explode out of the gate. So when I talk to people about how I manage through recessions and bear markets, traditionally, my funds go down with the market. So the market goes down 10, I go down 10. The idea is, though, that while I'm going down 10 and everyone's panicking and their houses are all on fire, I'm looking for opportunities that when we start to turn, explode out of the gate. And because I'm doing the work in the middle of the fire, I can find them. And I, and I always have before. 
And again, there are parts of the market that actually are getting very exciting for me, but it doesn't mean they're going to work tomorrow. So what I tell people is in bad markets, and this is a bad market for growth, you sort of have to ride it out. You can't just run to the hills and do this and, and get in the bunker because it's too late. The market's already come down. What you need to do is you need to find opportunity in the wreckage and own the wreckage for when it starts to come out. Right. Okay. Actually, expanding on that, we have a question. Are you seeing a rotation from growth to value right now? Absolutely. And I think that that's actually really bullish. So when you see a rotation from growth to value, it means you're not having a recession. Right? If you're having a recession, everything goes everything down. Goes. Like, like this. But if you're just rotating from growth to value, it means that probably we're not going into recession next year. And, and I think the market is telling you, look, next year's going to be slower growth. I think that next year the Fed's going to start to moderate its rate increases. These are the stocks that may work better next year relative to tech. And I would say maybe that's true. But I would also say that there are going to be parts of technology that are going to work next year as well. And those are the ones that we mentioned, the ones that have long, nice fundamentals and can bounce back. Um, but so that's what I'm seeing. And I think that if we were going into a recession, boy, it would be really different. Like mm -hmm. everything would be sold. So this is actually a constructive piece of information. Great. So actually speaking of next year, what sectors are you excited about as we head into 2019? So 2019 is going to be an interesting year. I, you mentioned home builders. I really like you yeah. as home builders. Um, I think that it is the best cyclical trade in the market. Um, I really like some of the, my favorite ideas uh, that have been sold down. I, I love Etsy. I think it's, it's going to continue to work. Um, stocks like Roku have sold down 50%. I think it's going to continue to work. I think that if you can pick through what I call secular growth tech, um, most of the best ideas are coming down like 50% because they've got it very expensive. But the fundamentals are still strong, and I think that they're going to continue to be strong for the next five, six, seven years. So I'm looking for really good companies that have good fundamentals that are going to grow for the next three or four or five years, and they're going to bounce back. Because ultimately what happens is we have this shift from growth to value. It's all psychological. People do dumb things. And then they're going to get all these value stocks, and then six months from now, when the transition has happened, yeah, and the Fed is, <laughs> yeah, the Fed's like, okay, we're going to slow down, and they're going to look at their portfolio and go, God, why do I own this? Why do I own this utility or this REIT or this? Why do I own gold? This is the dumbest thing ever. And they go back and buy something that's working, and you know, this got growth. And so I've seen this a million times. Um, it doesn't make the transition any less painful, because it's certainly painful for me. I, mean, I own a lot of my own money, so I'm like losing money with everybody else. But I'm actually seeing opportunity. It's it's actually getting exciting again to invest. Fantastic. We have a very good question here that just came in. Mark, how do you manage some of the unusual recent behavior from tech leaders and CEOs? <laughs> so FANG. Let's talk about FANG. Walk carefully. Yeah. yeah, so let's not call anyone out by name. I think that part of what you're seeing in technology is that the leadership is a bit broken. And I think that these are analyzable issues. So if you look at Facebook, Facebook is under pressure for lots of different reasons. All of them pretty clear pretty difficult to change. And, and they do kind of stem back to manage management, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you could see this coming. And it's funny, I'm, my funds are down a lot, but I actually mentioned missed most of the FANG blow-ups. Like, I didn't own Facebook, and I don't own Google. Well, I own some Google, but not that much. And um, so, so some of the large cap stocks are going to struggle. <clears throat> Apple is going X growth, which is can be not the best scenario. Google's got a lot of uh, issues on the regulation front. Um, a lot of their businesses are under pressure. Um, you know, a Amazon's taking share in advertising, and they've got and their cloud business is not as good as it could be. So, and Facebook is a train wreck. So there's a there's a lot of issues in mega cap tech, and that's another reason why tech in general is being sold, hmm. right? Because people for years have just bought Fang based technology funds, and which is why you're finding I'm other finding opportunities, right? right? Like I I don't I don't want to buy Facebook or. or Google or anything. I'm looking for the, the guys that are getting sold with those ETFs. Like, if you look at those ETFs, we see hundreds of names, right? And so they're just being sold because the, the large caps are not doing very well. There's lots of opportunity in those names a little further down. Like, mid cap, mid cap software looks great, but nobody wants to own it because it's stuck in all those ETFs that are just getting blown out the door every day. Um, and that's one of the problems that you have when everyone's investing in ETFs is a lot of good companies just get sold with everything else. So that's where opportunity is. Great. So we actually had a, a viewer wondering about that. Maybe if you could expand the question was with uh, the rise of ETFs in tech, how are you protecting against a sell-off in that space? Anything to add? Protecting is such a terrible word. <laughs> um, I just don't like that word. So I, I find that you know protecting or preserving capital or these are things that, that 
are not really part of my investment style. Um, what I say to people is I'm investing in what I think are the best opportunities and they're going to work, you know, 12, two years from now. Um, protecting capital is something that, frankly, I just don't do that well and I don't think many people do that that well um, because you need to own things that don't move. And I, I, I just don't find that to be a compelling strategy. So am I protecting you? No, as the market goes down, my funds will go down. What I'm saying, though, is, and I've been through this two other times, when the market starts to turn and goes the other way, it's my fund is, is, sell, is ready and it's fully invested and it captures all of that turn. And that's, that's how I prevent you know, major losses on the downside. Perfect. Now, Mark, I've heard you talk about this next topic before, <laughs> blockchain. Uh, there are a lot of blockchain companies <laughs> claiming revolutionary breakthroughs. Sure. There. How do you see the landscape evolving? So blockchain is interesting. Blockchain is a great technology looking for an application. Right. And the current cryptocurrencies are not the application. And I, I don't own any currency, and I don't think we should own any currency. Well, but I do like cryptocurrency. cryptocurrencies. But I do like the blockchain technology, and I think that it will present really great investment opportunities in the future. So I'm really on top of it by making no money on it. And a lot of real estate in, like in what we areas? don't know. We, we don't, don't know. We don't know what the applications Healthcare are. Healthcare is using it. It's Every, like, everyone's using it. It's like the internet, right? We, right. We, we knew the internet was going to be big, but we didn't know how until Netscape came along. Right. And there was a browser. It showed us. And it was like, oh, now I see. Blockchain is a similar thing. We don't have the application that yet gives us the visibility to say, oh, there's the roadmap. So when we get that, then we can start investing in massive scale. But at the moment, I'm keeping an eye on it. I really think the space is important. And I think that there's a lot of really smart people spending a lot of hours trying to get blockchain right. So it's very exciting, but not really investable. You're watching. I'm watching it. Okay. We actually had a couple questions on crypto as well, so thank you for covering that. <laughs> um, so next question for you, Mark, is US's trade rift with China resulting in a shift in tech leadership? Mm, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think that, um, that... First of all, what do you think of the trade bust up? Is it important to the way you're looking at the investing world? It, it, it's important. It's, it's obviously important if two of the world's largest economies are in conflict. And it certainly impacts certain businesses more than others. But it doesn't really change technology investing because the trends in technology investing are global. The cloud is for real. Mobile is for real. AI is for real, and they, you know, they are pervasive around the world. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't feel as though that trade tension thing is going to matter. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think about it. I think it's important, but it's certainly not something that's top of mind for me. Um, if they resolve the trade issues, great. If they don't, uh, it doesn't matter to me at the moment too much. Do you see it as a pause, a potential positive catalyst? Sure. To see things. I think that you're hunting for. I think I think it bounce. is a potential positive catalyst, but I think what's more important is that the Federal Reserve slows the rates of Fed increases, right. and I think that the key is to get some visibility on next year's economy. What's it going to look like? How fast are we going to grow? Folks are scared that this is the end, and and I think that the trade war is is like just super superfluous noise that we just can ignore, and we need to focus on. Where's the economy going, and what's the Fed going to do next? And that's why I think like the news we got on Friday was very important. We had a small, small change in potential language, right? And the Just market rally. A little rallied. bit of levity, right? Too. So you get a sense that the market's looking for, for that, and we'll see if it happens or not. Okay, great. Now, Mark, everyone is asking, what is your views on the cannabis industry? So uh, this is going to be a bad business. Um, it's, you know, it's like any commodity. They're growing a plant. They sell the plant. It's partially differentiated, I guess. Different strains have different effects on people. But it's basically competing, you know, head-on with alcohol. And, you know, it's another hallucinogenic thing. It competes still with all the illegal drugs. And I, I think that folks have extrapolated giant, giant markets, when in reality, I don't think the market's going to be nearly as big as they expect. Um, is, is everyone going to smoke weed all the time? Uh, maybe. It's going to be a shift, but it doesn't mean it's going to be bigger. And I think that the way to look at it is you can look at the size of the alcohol market in total, and you say, okay, well, 
Now we're going to put marijuana in there. And it's going to shave off a it's piece. It's going to shave off a piece, yeah. and maybe the whole pie gets bigger, and people are, you know, happy more often. But but you're still going to have, you know, some number in there. And it just feels as the market expectations for the size of the market have run away with the stocks. And the other thing is that they're not great management teams. These are not people I would trust with my money, most of them. There are some <clears> big <throat> moves by people who've been respected in various industries who've Absolutely. moved into to yeah, Absolutely. But seats. there are like hundreds of these companies, and how many of them have really great management teams? I right. don't know. They're all up a lot. I view the whole sector with some skepticism. Interesting. Okay. Great. Thanks for covering that. So we have um, a question here just about your different funds. If we can take a moment <coughs> to uh, distinguish between your three funds, how do they differ in strategy? So the easiest way to talk about that is um, Special Situations is a small mid-cap Canadian fund. Uh, it was my first fund. It's got a lot of strange things in it, um, a lot of private investments. investments. Um, You've had that for longer than 10 years? A yeah, than 10 years? 11 and a half years 11 now. 11 and a half years. And, uh, and so it, it's my original fund. It's, my, it's sort of the blueprint for everything else. Um, and it, on the risk spectrum, I put it somewhere probably in the middle of my funds. Growth Company is a larger cap, more more core sort of fund that's got less um, small stuff in it, larger cap stuff, um, fewer positions. It's, it's viewed as like less risky than the other ones. And then Innovators is new, and I'm still wrapping my arms around how to run this. Um, and I've told lots of folks, to give me some time to figure out this fund. It's because uh, it's a global innovation product, but because it's global, it's so broad. It's difficult for me to figure out, okay, well, where do I want to put the money and how do I want to invest and exactly what do I want to own? And I'm still struggling with that a little bit on this fund, but I, I view it as the fund with the most capacity. It's I have the most freedom. It's the easiest to run. Mm -hmm. So the other two funds um, both have huge Canadian content, and it's very difficult to move that much money around in Canada. But innovators, uh, you can change your mind tomorrow. You can go here or there, everywhere. It sounds like you easy. also, within that fund, have the opportunity to, you know, look at privates, look at, you know, sort of research in a different mm -hmm. way and apply that. To yes, yeah, it's it's well. really it's really fun to run, and it, and like I said, it is much easier to run than the other two products. Um, so I, I I love running the innovators fund, but I still haven't sort of figured out okay how do I want this to be positioned over time, mm -hmm. and it it takes a little while sometimes to figure out how to make sausage. Right. <laughs> Actually, with uh, with innovators, Mark, what is your outlook for emerging markets? What trends are you seeing in that part of the world? So, emerging markets definitely fall into the category of stocks that have been hated. That I think that um, may be starting to turn, and I think they would really benefit from you know a, a shrinking of the Federal Reserve's you know rate increases. Um, it's a tough market because it's not very liquid and. It's one of those ones where finding opportunity, especially on the innovation side, is really challenging. Most of the companies in emerging markets are like banks, utilities, a little bit of retail. So finding innovation is difficult. Um, you where can go do to, you find innovation outside of North America? There's a lot Europe? of it in Asia. Um, Asia. A lot of the Asian technology, though, is like semiconductors and Apple yeah. suppliers. and So it's not the sharp end of the innovation you know, spear. That's in the U.S.? Um, it's, mostly in, it's mostly in the U.S. That's where most of the most innovative companies are. Not all of them. There's some really great companies. Every country's got a few great companies. Um, and they're innovative, and you, and you need to learn them. But it's, it's a process of just getting comfortable with all these different countries. There's so many countries to invest in. So structurally, yeah, I think emerging markets are a really interesting place. Um, they're not a big part of the innovators' portfolio at the moment. Right. But it's certainly an area that, that I'm looking to add stuff in. Great. Now, Mark, is AI investable, or is it simply a competitive advantage within a diversified company? So I would argue that it's the latter. Okay. Um, I have several private investments in AI, and I find that AI is simply like optimization on a grander scale. Solving problems through machine learning is great, but it's hard to make a business out of it. It's basically making something in your company work better. So yeah, it's, it's part of a company's tech budget. Exactly. And it's part of their, exactly. What they're rolling out. Sure. And so that their payment system gets a little better, or their you know whatever system gets a little better because they're using AI to power it. So it's it's an enabling technology. It's not really an investment technology. Um, there are companies that are working on certain verticals that I think AI is is uniquely attuned for, and maybe they build companies out of those verticals. But I think it's going to be, again, it's going to be a pervasive technology that lots of companies use to solve, you know, specific problems in their business units. And it's not necessarily an investable by itself, you know, technology. The, the cleanest investment for it would have been NVIDIA, 
-hmm. and you know Nvidia is now being hit by crypto and gaming and whatnot. Um, in general, it's, it's it's hard to invest in AI as itself. Okay. Great. So we got a lot of questions coming in today, and way more than we can get to. So we'll do our best to get back to everybody today. We have time for one more question for Mark. Um, so Mark would like to ask you: um, Are you seeing any issues with companies' accounting procedures, such as with tech in the two thousands? So I hope we don't have to care. Um, generally, that becomes an issue at the bottom of the market when you know we have a recession and. Now we're scouring balance sheets to make sure that these guys actually have the cash. Generally in technology, technology companies have a lot of cash on the balance sheet, so you don't usually have to worry too much. They all pay themselves too much through options. Um, that has been an ongoing problem for 30 years. I have, probably will never change. So th there's clearly lots of option accounting going on. Um, but in general, uh, the, the stocks that I tend to own are not ones that like fraud is generally part of the equation. Right. Um, I think that you know one you can think about is like Valiant back in the day, where they rolled up a whole bunch of companies and there were lots of adjustments. I generally don't own roll-ups. I like transformative companies that have technology that's going to change something. So a roll-up isn't. It's just a financially engineered vehicle. I don't own too many of those. So I, I would argue my portfolio doesn't have a lot of exposure to that sort of risk. Right. Um, I have different kinds of risk, but I don't have that one. Okay, well, thank you so much for the questions from the audience. Those were excellent questions. I know there are a lot more. Um, you, uh, I understand you, you read a bit. You, mm -hmm. you have an eclectic reading um, set of, of books and, and various periodicals that you go through online or, or in a hard copy. Is there a trend that you're willing to point to that maybe has nothing to do with what people generally think are investable emerging trends? Oh, shock us in that's, some way. That's a hard <laughs> question. Um, so some of the out, outlier things that I think about, and they're not new though, they're, but there's something that we need to think about. Um, you know, obviously climate change is a big one mm -hmm. in terms of how it's interacting with our economies globally. Um, how does it impact the food supply? How does it affect energy use? Um, what are we doing about it? Um, the culture wars in America deserve a lot of um, attention. Um, it, it, if you look at it, it's really um, quite disturbing the trends you're seeing in the United States in terms of the level of conflict um, and you're seeing it erupt in, in lots of bad um, situations. So those are a couple of things. The other one I think about obviously is the US-China conflict. Um, that is not, not anything I can do about that. Um, in general you're seeing a lot of uprisings from folks who have been disenfranchised by the current global economy. So Brexit is an example of that. Um, what's going on in, in the United States is an example of that. And that's a concern. Like, is this a long run trend? Is this just a blip because people are unhappy? Um, and is this, are there real winners and losers in this you know, society that we've created? And what are those tensions and how do they spill through? So there are always big things to think about, and, and I do think about them. Um, it's hard to figure out how they fit into the investment cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that we didn't talk about that I think is really interesting is the advent of personalized medicine, which is finally starting to happen. And there's some really interesting companies in uh, biotech that are doing some amazing things that could really change the way um, healthcare is delivered and could change how people actually are treated for a whole host of diseases. So at the same, so on one side, there's that awful political, you know, cultural war issues. And on the other side, there's some really fascinating things going on in technology that really could change the world for the better. So, you know, we got a little bit of both. It's sort of uh, always the way it's been, isn't it, on mm -hmm. some level? Okay, mm -hmm. Mark Schmiel, so glad that you could join us for Fidelity Connects today and glad that you tuned in to join us. Mark, of course, is portfolio manager for three funds that you should know about, Special Situations, as well as the Global Innovators Fund and also the Canadian Growth Company Fund. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next week, same time. I'm Pamela Ritchie.